Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Hey, my name is Savut. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really excited to share God's Word with you this morning. But before we jump into the scripture, I wanted to share a quick life update. So my wife, she was a beautiful woman in the kids camp video. Uh, we are expecting our first kid this summer. So yeah, and, and we went to uh, see the ultrasound and saw our baby moving. Um, I started tearing up. And then when I found it was a boy, I started crying. So uh, <laughs> Can't wait to meet our son this summer. Um, a lot of people have been asking us, hey, you guys excited? You guys ready? So I'm excited. Yes. Am I ready? No. <laughs> I can't imagine a little Savut running around. That scares me. Uh, we get the opportunity to take care of him, raise him up in the ways of God, and make sure he's safe. So um, a lot of responsibility there. Um, and so if you have any words of wisdom, send an email to allison at experiencecc.com. <laughs> She's the wise one in our marriage. So uh, if this is your first time here with us, I'm really glad you are here. Um, what we do at this church is we go through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, line by line. And so we have been in the book of Galatians, all right? And so last week, Pastor Corey taught in chapter 4, and today we'll be in chapter 5. Um, and so far in Galatians, what we have seen uh, is that this is a letter from Paul. And he's writing a letter to the churches in Galatia. And, and we see a lot of passion from Paul. But we also see some moments of anger. And so the passion comes from his love for the young believers. But then his anger comes because there's a group of legalists. There's a group of religious leaders called the Judaizers who are teaching them a way that is contrary to the gospel. And so Paul steps in and, and corrects them, but he also encourages the believers to remind them of who Jesus is. And so last week, Pastor Corey taught in chapter 4, and, and the question that he asked was, are we consciously choosing freedom? And, and we have to make that choice, right? We get the opportunity to, to choose, and that is because of God's love for us that he gives us this choice. And if we choose life in Jesus and relationship with him, then we will experience freedom and love, and joy, and peace, and we'll experience uh, the things of God, and he will save us here on this earth and in the next life. But if we don't, then we won't experience any of those things. We will experience the opposite of freedom, the things that enslave us. And in order for us to get to the point to choose freedom, we have to get rid of the things that enslave us or entangle us. And that's what Corey finished with is uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the verse that talks about running the race well, but then there are things, the sins that so easily entangle us. What are those things that entangle us? We have to put those things to the side so that then we can keep our eyes on Jesus. So this morning, we will continue the same idea of freedom, right? We'll, we'll continue this, this theme of freedom in Jesus. And the point that we will talk about is a relationship with Jesus should produce the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it should show up in our life, right? The, the, the fruit of the Spirit should continue to grow in believers if you have a relationship with Jesus, not a life of slavery, right? And so that's what we will talk about today. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Galatians chapter 5. When you walked in, you should have received the notes handout. Everything that I will say will be on the TV screens. You can also download the Experience Community app and follow along under the sermon notes. Let's go to God in prayer before we jump into his word. Father God, thank you so much for how amazing you are. God, thank you that you are holy. God, you are perfect. You are righteous. There is no other name that is worthy of worship except the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for all of the churches that are gathering this morning. If they proclaim that you are the king of kings, Lord, would you bless those communities? God, we also pray for this community and all of our other campuses. Lord, would you encourage us and challenge us and speak to us through your word? Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of worship. Thank you for the freedom that we have to gather here. I pray that everything that we do and say would honor you and make your name known. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 5. For freedom, Christ set us free. 
Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Take note, I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourselves circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. For we eagerly await through the Spirit by faith the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. You are running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. I myself am persuaded in the Lord that you will not accept any other view. But whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. Verse 12, Paul gets a little savage here. I wish those who are disturbing you might also let themselves be mutilated. Okay, so the first verse that we see in this chapter, it says, it is for freedom that Jesus set you free, right? It is not to go back into a life of slavery. So the, so the Judaizers, they were teaching legalism to the young Christians. And so Paul steps in to remind the believers who they belong to, of their identity in Christ. And he also warns them, hey, you guys got to stand firm in that identity, And that's the same truth for us. Like, if we don't stand firm in our identity in Jesus, then we can also submit again to a yoke of slavery. Like, standing firm means that we have to be intentional with our relationship with God. Like, we have to choose to acknowledge that we belong to Jesus. Like, we can't lollygag in life, or we can't just aimlessly live life. Because if that's the case, we're not going to stand firm, and, and we will start to listen to the loud voices that want your attention. And we would then start to say, man, I'm going to adopt other identities. I'm going to take on the things that the world is telling me will fulfill you. Right? And that's what we're seeing here. And so what the question for us is what gods do we return to over and over again? Last week, Pastor Corey talked about the things that enslave us, like greed. It could be material things or lust, things that lead to sexual immorality or performance trap. The performance trap, what he talked about is this idea that we have to work and perform to be known by God. But the truth is, you're already known by God. He sees you and he loves you and he meets you where you're at. And so we don't have to perform for him. We, we, we take on his righteousness because of who Jesus is. And so we cannot run back to the God that will never fulfill us. We have to remain true to the one God that will always satisfy us. So we were set for freedom, not slavery. So side note here, for the last four times I've taught, for some reason I talk about circumcision, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Last time I taught, I talked about the 204 skins in 1 Samuel. Now I'll talk about this. So anyways, Paul's issue with the Judaizers wasn't with circumcision, but it was with using circumcision as a sign, a uh, confession of faith, right? It was a way to say you have to be circumcised to be accepted by God, So if they adopt this teaching, this is what Paul says. Jesus will not benefit you at all. That's the same truth for us. Like when we embrace the law in our own ways and our works, and we attempt to earn acceptance acceptance based on like how good we are or what, what good we can do, then what's the need for Jesus? What's the need for God sending his only son to die on the cross for us, to be nailed, to be crucified, and then raised again from the dead? What's the need for that? What's the point when Jesus said, it is finished, if we continue to try to add things to it? Amen. What's the point to, for Jesus to say, it is finished, and then we say, ah, oh, I want to take away some of the things in Scripture. I want to take away some of the things from Jesus. Is Jesus enough or not? It is in Christ alone. That's it. Nothing else, right? So it is either Jesus is enough for me or he's not. And some of us may worship, and we we can say that Jesus is enough, but the life we live sometimes show that he's not enough. Sometimes we show that we got to run to other things to find fulfillment. And this is the issue that Paul had. And so he talks about being alienated from Christ. 
and then fallen from grace. When we look at this verse, we can take it out of context and we can say, this is talking about whether or not one can lose his salvation. And that's not what it's talking about. Paul is referring to the system of law, which is based on our own works and how good we are, versus the system of grace based on how good Jesus is and who he is and what he's done, right? That's the two things he's referring to. And so the people, the young Christians, uh, they're, they're listening to this lie that, that says that they need to be accepted by, by circumcision, right? By legalism based on their own works rather than trusted in Jesus. So those, those are the two sides that we see here. And when we embrace legalism, when we embrace our own ways, it's not that God's grace isn't available to us or, or taken away from us. It's that we said, no, thank you, God. I don't want your grace. I want, I want to do it my own way. That's what we're seeing here. That's what he means that they have fallen from grace. And so early on, when, when, when Paul was teaching them the truth, they, they were running their race well, right? They were, they were uh, living it out. They were listening, and they gave their lives over to Jesus. But then he went away, and he's like, what, what happened to you guys? You guys are running the race well. Well, what happened is the, the religious leaders started teaching bad theology. They started pointing them away from the true gospel, and they let the, the, the influence of their teaching creep into their lives. And this prevented them from obeying the truth. Notice how it says prevented them from, being, um, from obeying the truth, not obeying the law. It's obeying the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done. That's what they were distracted by. And so for us, church, we need to be familiar with God's voice. We have to know God's voice. And in order for us to know God's voice, we have to spend time with him. We have to spend time talking with him, listening to him. And then we also have to test everything with God's word. We have to, in order for us to know God's word, we have to open up God's word. We have to read about his character. And when we hear his, when we are familiar with God's voice and familiar with his word, we know the real God, which will help us identify the false gods which will help us identify when, when someone may say in our culture, like, man, it's all about you, right? You ever heard sermons that like, they never open up the Bible and it's just like motivational speeches, right? And it's all about you. Do your, it's, it's all living in your best life. And God is love. And listen, that's the truth. God is love, but it is out of God's love for you that he doesn't want you to do whatever you want. And so sometimes we're like, man, I just want to go listen to something that's going to encourage me and make me feel good. And listen, I don't care how it makes you feel. If it's contrary to God's word, it is not from God. Amen. And that's what we have to hold on to. Like, hey, I want to hear God's voice and I want to hold on to God's word. Because in 1 John, it says that there will be a time when false prophets will come and share a false gospel. And you got to be aware of that. And that's happening in our day today too. And the reason for this is, uh, Paul writes, a little leaven will eventually spread. Basically, what he's talking about is a little bad teaching. And if you're like, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, if you live by it, it will continue to grow. You'll continue to head in the wrong direction. In James chapter 1, James writes, if we give ourselves over to our desires, it will give birth to sin. And then once sin is fully grown, it will, give birth to, it, it will grow into death. So we got to get a grip on the sin and the bad teaching in our lives or else it's going to grow. It is a big deal. And it's a big deal, and this is why Paul is calling it out. He has his heart for the young believers. He has a heart for the, for the Christians here, and he confronts the false teachers. He says, hey, you guys are so focused on having circumcision as a way to be accepted. Why don't you guys just cut it all off? Mutilate yourselves. That's what he says. And you're like, and he's being a little sarcastic, right? But there's some truth behind this. He's really frustrated. He's really angry. And, and maybe you're looking at this verse and you're thinking about Paul and you're like, man, Paul was harsh. You know what also is harsh? It's false teachers leading young believers away from Jesus. That's harsh. And so we have, Paul loves the believers way too much to not confront the false teachers. And we have to get to that point in our lives too. We have to love the people around us enough to call them out on their sin. If there are believers that we love and they're headed on the wrong path of destruction, we should lovingly step in and remind them of who they belong to. Point them back to God's word. Point them back to Jesus. When people do that in my life, it's painful. It's not fun. Initially, I'm like, man, I don't like you. Right? My feelings may get hurt. But on the other side, I'm so grateful that they called me out. I'm so grateful that people love me enough to remind me of what God thinks of me, what God sees in me, and how much God loves me. 
Sometimes we don't wanna do this because we're afraid to hurt people's feelings. Like we gotta get to the point where we care more about their souls than their feelings. We gotta care about the path they're headed on that one day if they don't, if they don't surrender their life to Jesus, the flesh will overtake them and then they will, um, we'll, we'll hear about the consequences in this next part, that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's go to this next part, verse 13. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. I say then, walk by the spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. Here's an important one. And anything similar. I am warning you about these things. As I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul is very direct here. And so the first thing we see is, hey, don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, the legalists had this fear that if there were no moral law or, or, or like rules, then what will happen is then people would just say, I can be free to do whatever I want. And so Paul addresses that here. He's aware of it. And he says, hey, use your freedom not to do whatever you want and give yourself over to the flesh, but to serve one another through love. And so in our culture today, we have this definition of freedom that says, I can do whatever I want, that there are no boundaries, that no one can tell me what to do because I'm free to be who I want to be. And that definition, when we adopt that definition and we say there's no boundaries in this life, then this causes us to say, I worship God, but I want to live however I want. I identify as a Christian, but I'm going to continue to do me. So if we use God's grace as a freedom to sin and live however we want, then we need to examine whether or not we have an authentic relationship with Jesus. Because the truth is, if you have experienced the love, grace, mercy, and power of God, it should transform you from the inside out. You realize my life no longer belongs to me. It belongs to Jesus. And I don't live how I want. I live to honor him. That's what a real believer looks like. And so in Romans 6, Paul addresses this. He says, should we continue to sin more so that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Some of us like the idea of abusing God's grace. And if that's the case, I don't know if we fully believe and surrender our life to the one that has saved us. So then there's this battle that we see in this chapter, the rest of this chapter, this battle between the spirit that lives inside of believers, the Holy Spirit, versus the flesh, the sinful nature. And so when we begin a relationship with God, it is, it is a good desire to say, God, what more can I do for you? Right? We, so as believers, we have that desire. We should have that daily. And we may want to please God, but our sin nature can pull us into disobedience if we don't depend on the spirit because there's that battle going on. And so in Romans 7, Paul writes about it. Why do I do the things I don't want to do, right? And so it, it's, it's, it's very detailed on that. It explains that in Romans 7. And so as believers, the Holy Spirit that lives in us empowers us to walk in obedience. Like every moment of our lives, we have an opportunity to worship and obey Jesus or not. Every moment, we have the opportunity to say, yes, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to listen to you. I want to honor you. I want to worship you. I want to serve you and love other people around me. Or we can live a selfish life and be disobedient. That's the two options that we have. And if we depend on Jesus daily, we will gradually move away from evil and look more like him. 
That's the life that we should live. Gradually moving away from evil, so the worship team back here, and moving towards him. Right? No one thought that was funny? Worship team's evil? Okay, perfect. <laughs> so moving away from evil and moving closer to Jesus, that's the process of sanctification. Right? That's what the church word sanctification looks like. That we're looking more and more like Jesus as we continue to surrender our lives to him daily. So then it says, the works of the flesh are obvious, right? So although you may have that interior battle going on, right? It's invisible. No one can see it. And it's like your spirit versus the flesh that lives in you, okay? So, so there's just two things warring inside of you. Although it's invisible to you, what will happen is it would eventually spill out if you give yourself over to the flesh. It's going to spill itself out, right? And so Paul lists some sins that we start to see in, in, in our walks with Jesus sometimes, works of the flesh. What will happen is we can see some sins dealing with sexuality. The works of the flesh are, are evidence. So there's, two, there's three sins that he lists that deals with sexuality. And then there's about, there's two that deals with religion. So idolatry and sorcery. And then there's eight that deals with relationships because we were designed for community. We were designed to live together in this life. And if we give ourselves over to the works of the flesh, it will destroy fellowship with each other. And then there's two that, that talks about drunkenness. And maybe you're in this room and you're like, okay, Savut, I'm, I'm pretty good on sexuality. Like, I don't struggle with that. And then you're like a religion. Like, oh, no, I don't idolize anything. Like, God is my, my only God. That's the one I worship. And then you're like relationships. And you're like, man, Savut, have you seen the people I'm, I'm around? We're amazing. And then drunkenness. You're like, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, don't, I don't struggle with that at all. And if that's you, then you probably struggle with pride and lying, right? <laughs> And this is, this is the thing. This is why he says, and anything similar, because we can look at a list and we're like, man, I'm good. I don't struggle with any of those things. But Paul writes, and anything similar, because sin is anything that separates us from God. Sin is anything that takes us away from God. And so we need God's help in these battles, because the truth is we are incapable to overcome the flesh on our own strength. Like Savut on his own will lose every time to the flesh. The same thing is the same truth for you. You, without God's help, will lose every time. We have to depend on God's spirit. So then Paul gives us direct warning about sin. Paul is direct about the consequences of sin here. This is what it says in the scripture. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's not popular to talk about. And some of you guys will be upset but this is what it says in the Bible. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So who will not inherit the kingdom of God? Someone who lives in habitual sin. Someone who has the same fruit showing up. That is showing the worst of the flesh. Someone who ignores God. God is trying to get your attention and you said, no, thank you. And then you refuse to repent. That's what it looks like to live, to practice such things, the works of the flesh. And maybe you're in here and you're like, but I come to church once a week. If you come to church once a week and your life is enslaved to the sins of the world, maybe that's greed. Maybe that's, there, there's a, a drunkenness, right? Maybe there's sexual immorality. And here's a popular one. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe that's what you're enslaved to. And if you, if you say, but Sabuda, I come to church once a week, but all those things show up. Here's, here, here's the truth. Coming to church once a week doesn't save you. It is a relationship with God that saves you. So you surrender your entire life and you live for him daily. There's six other days of the week. How are you living for Jesus the other six days? Coming in here, worshiping, and raising your hand, that doesn't save you. God knows your heart and he wants all of you. People would know us by our fruit. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 7. So we can say all day long that we're a Christian, but their fruit will show who we worship. The fruit will show whether or not we believe and, and trust in him. This last part talks about the fruit of the spirit. This is a little more fun to talk about. So, But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. 
And so that last section, I, I know like talking about the works of the flesh and the sins that he lists, uh, that can seem a little overwhelming. And that can seem like, man, this is just, this is a hopeless life. Uh, the, the, the battle that goes on inside believers, the battle of the flesh and the spirit, that can seem overwhelming. And then also when you look around in this world and you see the chaos and the darkness, and you're like, man, this, this world is crazy. I just don't know how we're going to do this. Listen, I know it's overwhelming. I know the flesh is strong, but God is good enough and big enough to overcome that. God is good enough and big enough to rescue you from that slavery. He wants to set you free by the fruit of the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that's the gift that we get when we begin a relationship with him. We get God living inside of us. And the fruit of the Spirit can always conquer the works of the flesh. Always. Every moment, we get the opportunity to depend on God, and he will overcome the works of the flesh. But sometimes the issue is we give the enemy way too much power. Is there an enemy in this world? Yes. Is he looking to destroy you? Yes. Is he stronger than Jesus? No, he's not. And sometimes what we do is, let's, I'm gonna give an example, okay? So if, you, so if you're on your phone and you're you know, watching YouTube or whatever, and sometimes you're starting at seven o'clock, I'm like, all right, like everybody's in bed. I'm just gonna scroll on YouTube. And you're like, holy moly, how is it midnight already, right? You start scrolling, and you're like, oh, wow, there's an attractive man or an attractive woman in there. And then it's 2 a.m. and you're like, man, I'm looking up things I shouldn't be looking up. Right? And you've given yourself over to this. And then the next day you wake up and you want to talk to your accountability partner, right? So you're, you're like reaching out and you're like, man, dude, Satan really got me last night. It's like, no, Satan really didn't get you. You were just being dumb, right? So we put ourselves in positions and places that we probably shouldn't be in, right? Put some more boundaries in your life because we've got to be intentional and stand firm. Here's the things with, with, with Christians, um, and I've done this before. But we like to blame the enemy because it justifies for us to continue to sin. We like to say, man, Satan's doing this. He's got this stronghold on me with pornography. He's got this stronghold on me with drugs. He's got this stronghold on me, whatever the case is. And we keep blaming Satan, but it's actually us choosing to sin because we like how it feels sometimes. There's this idea here of the singular fruit. So when you read it, it says the fruit of the Spirit but then earlier, we just saw the works of the flesh, the plural version, okay? And then, and then we see in the Bible, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. All right, so, so there's a significance in that. So when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, God has gifts of His Spirit that He gives to certain people based on who He chooses and, and, and what He wants to use for His kingdom. So for instance, some people may have the gift of teaching. Some people may have the gift of prophecy or the gift of tongues, but not everyone has all of the gifts. So I don't have all of the gifts and you don't have all the gifts. But now we see the fruit of the Spirit as a singular. So when we begin a relationship with God, it's not like we, don't, we, we can't have all of the fruit um, and it's only available like I only get love, joy, and peace and then I don't get the rest. The truth is when you begin a relationship with Jesus, we can have all of it. God wants us to have all of it, right? So all of it should be growing in us. But sometimes, I know we are all uniquely created. We're, we're, we're different, okay? So what this looks like in my walk is when I am not keeping in step with the Spirit and walking closely with God, what can happen is the area of self-control shows itself out, right? It's, it's, that's the weak area of my life. And my life seems chaotic. It seems like it's falling apart when I'm not walking closely with Jesus. And what can happen is I have the temptation to try to give myself self-control. That's not how it works. Like, I can't muster up self-control on my own. I need God's help to grow that area. And so maybe in your life, it's love. And you're just like, I just can't love people. I don't have that fruit of the Spirit. But if you have the Spirit living inside of you, you do, right? You just have to surrender that area and say, God, I, I need my heart to soften for people. God, can you show me how to love? God, help me connect with people and help me see people the way that you see them. So we have to pray to God and say, God, I need this help, right? I can't do this on my own. I can't grow the fruit of the Spirit on my own strength. So we need God's help. So the question is, is there fruit growing in your life? The fruit of the Spirit. We're going to spend some more time on that at the end. Paul uses the word crucified here. So if you belong to Jesus, you have to crucify the flesh. And he uses this to remind us of the cross. The point is back to what Jesus did for us, dying on the cross to be crucified on the cross for our sins. And then he also reminds us 
that we are to take up our cross daily and follow him. That's what Jesus talks about. We have to take up our cross daily and follow him. And so if we belong to Jesus, this is a daily thing that we do sometimes. Crucify the flesh, nail it to the cross. Now, some, some, some of you are, are in here and you're like, man, this battle, it just, it just keeps going on. And I'm trying to depend on the spirit. Like I'm, I'm giving it over, but it keeps coming back. Sometimes it will be a battle until we get to heaven. That's what Paul talks about, the thorn in his side. You may have a battle that will go on while you're here on earth forever, but it's a battle that we have to get serious about. It's a battle that's worth it to surrender each day, each moment to Jesus, because in the end, you'll be in heaven with him and you won't have to worry about the battle anymore. He's already won and we get to be with him where there be no more tears, no more sadness. We perfect community with Jesus. He says to keep in step with the Spirit. So if we live by the Spirit, he says, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So if the Spirit is the source of our life, if we say Jesus is Lord, then let him be Lord. If we say Jesus is where I find life, then let him guide us. Now the religious leaders, the Judaizers, one of their fears was that Jesus wasn't enough, that the Spirit that lives inside of believers wasn't a good enough guide so if you're a believer, you've experienced this. You ever go somewhere you shouldn't go, do something you probably shouldn't do, spend some time with people that you probably shouldn't be around, and you get this like weird feeling in you. You get this still small voice that basically is like, hey, this is not what I want you to do. Hey, I don't want you to go that direction. Right? That's what we call conviction. That's how the Spirit guides us and leads us. When we are off track, he tells us, hey, get back on track. The question, though, is when we experience conviction, how will we respond we have two options. We can say, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, I do trust you. Jesus, the conviction I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing, like, you know what's better for me, so I'm going to surrender to you. I want to follow you. Or we can say, and this is kind of what we do sometimes, is, Jesus, I, I like the idea of worshiping you until you told me that. Jesus, I like that, but now it's uncomfortable. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be Lord over my life. So when we experience that conviction, do we trust Jesus or do we not? Last thing he says, this is really awesome. Um, he says, don't become conceited. Because, and I experienced this my first year of being a believer. Once believers experience freedom in Jesus, this new life in him, and then we got freedom away from the flesh, and we're like, man, this is great to be away from the sin. And then we start to live by the Spirit. What will happen is Satan will tempt you with pride. He will tempt you to say, look at all the things that you've done. Look at how far you've come. Look at how amazing you are. You're just that good. That's what Satan will tell you. And some of us will believe it. And we're like, man, I'm so awesome. I just kicked sin in the butt, right? I'm so amazing. Look at how I saved myself. We sound like fools, right? What will happen is pride will creep in and we become conceited. You guys ever been around someone that just knows everything? You ever been around someone that's like, they're always right? What will happen is people, when we, when, we, when we get pride in our life and become conceited, it will provoke wars with others. We won't be fun to be around. Humility is needed if we want to belong to Jesus and live by the Spirit. Humility is saying, I can't save myself. I need a Savior. Humility is saying, I don't know what I'm doing in this life. I need a Spirit to guide me. Because there is no hope in this world without Jesus. There is no hope in this life without Jesus. Because there's no hope in the battle that you have with the flesh if you don't depend on the Spirit. There's nothing in this world that will ever fully satisfy you except a relationship with Jesus. And that's what we have to surrender to. And so as we wrap up our time today, I want to, to give you an image. Start off with this image. Paul writes, it is for freedom that Jesus set us free, not slavery. And so before Jesus came and died on the cross for us, we were all in this prison cell and there was no way out, right? We, had, um, we, we needed someone to open the door and save us. But once Jesus came, the door swung wide open for all of us. So we have the choice to choose to walk out or to remain in the prison cell. And in the prison cell, and this is what it looked like for my life, because it's not as just, it's not you know, sometimes like, just walk out. Sometimes it's not that easy because when you're filled with chaos and hurt and pain and sin, you just don't see the other side. 
And so what it looked like in my life for 18 years, I was longing for love. I was addicted to things. I was lost. And I needed someone to visit my prison cell and introduce me to Jesus, to visit my prison cell and say, hey, there's a God that loves you and he's opened this door, but you got to choose to walk out. You got to take that step of faith. And that's what I did. I took the step of faith to experience this freedom, this new life with Jesus. But the thing is, some of us, what we need to do is we are in that cell and we have to take steps to crawl out. Sometimes it may take someone coming to visit our prison cells to tell us about Jesus. So what that looks like for us is sometimes for us, we may need to go encourage other people and tell them about the hope that we have in Jesus because they need to see the steps they need to take to experience this freedom. But I know that life isn't perfect when I, when I surrender my life to Jesus because there's that flesh that still goes on. And so if we, if we have experienced the freedom of Jesus, the question is, why do we run or crawl back into our prison cells? The gods that can't save us, the things that continue to leave us empty. Here's why I do it. So when I am discouraged, when I'm distracted, when I forget who I belong to, what will happen is I will crawl back to the things that feel familiar, the things that I think will fulfill me, the things that may give me temporary satisfaction and a good feeling for a moment. We cannot run back to the gods that can't save us. We have to barricade that path back to say, I no longer, I don't ever want to go back to that life. I don't ever want to run back to those gods because they, they can't fully satisfy me. Because the flesh is strong, I know that. And we have to acknowledge that, that the sinful nature inside of us is strong. And if the spirit doesn't live in us, so if you're not a believer, you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you, the truth is you're going to be hopeless in the battle against flesh. All you're going to do is live out the works of the flesh. And without the spirit, we will live in unrepentant sin. And living a life without Jesus means that we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Talking about sin is not popular in church. I know it's not, but it's necessary because the Bible talks about it. It's necessary because the consequences mean that you, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And I know sometimes you're just like, man, I just want to hear that God is love. God is love. That's the truth. But like I said, it is out of God's love for you that he doesn't want you to remain the same. He doesn't want you to remain in that prison cell. He wants you to come on out to experience life with him because he created us for a relationship with him. And so although the flesh is strong, the good news is the fruit of the spirit is stronger. The good news is the Holy Spirit that lives in us is stronger and so when we begin a relationship with God, we have a new identity. This is what Paul writes in Galatians 2. It is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. And so the life I now live belongs to him. And so the spirit who lives in us is stronger than the flesh. And that's the way we have to live life. That's the best life to live. We have to cultivate the fruit of the spirit. And how do we do that? On our, our side, for our responsibility, how we do that is choosing to read the Bible. We have a choice. We have to go and read. We say this every week at this church. You got to read. You got to pray. You got to worship. You got to obey because these things are important. This is, this is us choosing to worship God. Reading the Bible even when we don't feel like it. Because when we read about God's word and God's, about his character and his promises, that will encourage us to, to hold on to the truth in times when things are shaky. We could hold on to this firm God, God's word, right? Hold on to that. And then praying. So we have to communicate to God. God cares about every detail about your life. He cares about the things that maybe you're stressed about. He cares about the things that you're excited about. He cares about you. And so he wants you to just to share that life with him, share moments with him. Part of praying too means listening. Sometimes we got to shut up to, to listen to God, right? We got we to shut up to be able to hear what God is trying to tell us. I've been there. I'm, man, like sitting quiet for 10 minutes is hard. <laughs> you guys ever tried that? It's hard. But sometimes that's what we need, just to sit still and be with God. And then worshiping. So this weekly gathering is important, right? For us to come and worship Jesus together. This is vital. And it's not just once a week. We know that. It's throughout our weeks too. But in the times when I'm discouraged and I'm distracted, I've had a really rough month or a rough, rough week, 
It is coming into the sanctuary and worshiping with you guys. That encourages me. It reminds me of how good God is. It reminds me of God's love for me. And then obeying, we have to be obedient to what God is telling us, the things that he's convicting us about. Will we trust him or not? And the more that we are conformed to the image of God, the less power the flesh has on us. Man, I've seen this to be true in, in my mentor and his wife's life. They exemplify the fruit of the Spirit. Anytime I'm around them, they point me to Jesus. And I'm like, man, I just want to know Jesus like they do. But the thing is, what I realize is that they've been following Jesus for 50 years. They've been having small moments of reading, praying, worshiping, and obeying over time, over a period of time. And sometimes for us, we're like, man, I don't know if like obeying and worshiping and praying and reading, I don't know if this is worth it, but do it for a year and you can look back a year later and be so glad that you chose Jesus over the flesh. That's what, that's what it looks like in our life. And so maybe you have older people in your life that you just admire. That should encourage you, but I also want to encourage you that we are all on a journey. And so you don't just start off saying yes to Jesus and your life looks amazing, right? It, it takes a lifetime of surrendering daily to God. So all you have to do is focus on this, the progress that you're making. It's not perfection, but it's progress to look more and more like Jesus daily. And so what fruit do you bear in your life? Are the works of the flesh obvious? Do we use our freedom to live selfishly? Is life all about you? If that's the case and you say you are a Christian, you got to get serious and crucify the flesh. Get serious and crucify the flesh because if not, the flesh will overtake you. Do we bear the fruit of the Spirit? Because when we experience the love, grace, mercy, and power of Jesus, it should transform us from the inside out we should realize like life is no longer about me. It's all about Jesus. And I want to live for him. We should walk toward Jesus and away from evil. That's what sanctification looks like. So I want to finish with two verses. The first one, Romans 8. If you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So the first thing we see is if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. Which means if you live life and it's all about you, life will be miserable. I've tried that. Making, making it all about me and want, wanting everyone to serve me. That's a miserable life that's going to lead to emptiness. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's how, we try, that's how we find true life, is trusting in the Spirit. And then if you are a believer, here's the truth. You've received the Spirit of adoption. That's the new identity that we take on. So because of that identity, we should show the fruit of the Spirit in our life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Maybe you're in this room and you're like, man, I, I, I worship Jesus and I'm reading and I'm trying my best and I just, the, the works of the flesh are just too strong. Paul says this in Romans 8, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And so if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in believers, we have zero excuse to not have the fruit of the spirit growing in us. Sometimes for us, like, Maybe we're just trying too hard on our own strength. We need to try less harder, right? I don't know if that makes sense, but don't try as hard and trust in God more. Give over that area of your life to God and watch him work. A relationship with Jesus should produce the fruit of the spirit. This is what Christians should be known for. The issue with the church and Christians sometimes is we're so loud about what we're against. We're so focused on the things that we are against that people actually don't know what we are for. Sometimes we're known more for what we're against than what we're for. This is what we, we, we will be known for if we will surrender our life to Jesus. If we live in this daily relationship with Jesus, we will start to show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life. 
You guys bow your heads with me.